Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And I'd like to welcome you to the September edition of the Ag Sector Council Seminar Series, which is a flagship series of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and is run by the AgriLinks team under the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development, or KDAD, project. And as I'm sure all of you know, rice is very delicious, uh, but it's also a vitally important crop for the developing world. And that's why we were very excited to have the opportunity um, to have Dr. Ziegler with the International Rice Research Institute with us today. Uh, but before we get started, I always like to go through a few basic housekeeping issues. First and foremost, we always ask you to please silence them, um, just so that we don't interrupt the speakers, so if you wouldn't mind doing that. Although if you are a social media maven, you are welcome to keep your cell phone handy and uh, tweet along with the event using the Ag Events hashtag that you see up on the left there. Also, just to let you know, uh, we are broadcasting via webinar and recording this event. We'll send you all the recording afterwards <coughs> in case you'd like to share it with your colleagues. Uh, but that means um, that for the Q&A session, we'll need to pass around a microphone so that the webinar participants can hear your questions. So we generally ask that you hold questions until after the presentation uh, so that we can pass you this mic. All right, so that's uh, about it. I'd like to pass the microphone over to Sahara Moon Chapatin, who is Division Chief for Agricultural Research with the Bureau for Food Security. And she'll give a brief welcome and introduce Dr. Ziegler. Thanks, Julie. Well, it's really great to see everyone here and a real honor to be able to introduce Dr. Ziegler, who is the director of the International Rice Research Institute. For those of you who don't know, that's one of the CGR centers, the International Agricultural Research Centers, uh, located around the world who have the mission of supporting agriculture and doing agricultural research in support of developing countries. Um, ERI, the Rice Research Center, is based in the Philippines, and it works in over 25 countries around the world. It's a very long-standing partner to USAID. We support um, research activities, and we work with ERI collaboratively in supporting research activities around the world, including also some of the technology scaling activities that um, have been one of Administrator Shaw's priorities in the last couple of years. Notably, there was work done in Bangladesh led by ERI around scaling rice seed that was quite successful. Um, Dr. Ziegler has had a long and illustrious career prior to working at ERI, where he has been the director for almost 10 years now. He has worked in the Republic of Congo, in Colombia, in Burundi, in Mexico, in the United States. He has a number of awards, but one jumped out at me. That was the Global Innovator Award from Time in 2007. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ziegler. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, is it rolling? Bob, um, can you hear me? OK. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. And I really appreciate you all coming out on a Wednesday morning, six days before the end of a fiscal year. I think some of you are probably running around quite uh, like, I don't want to say chickens with the head cut off, but uh, like crazy. But uh, anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure to talk with you about rice and about the research that we're doing at Erie and with partnerships around the world and give you an idea of really some of the great uh, opportunities that uh, science is offering to address some of the greatest problems that are that are facing us around the world. Uh, as Sahara mentioned, I hail from uh, Erie. Uh, we've been around since 1960. We were founded by the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations in response to tremendous concerns about global food security uh, that were coming bubbling up in the 1950s. Very straightforward mission addressing poverty and hunger, uh, nutrition, uh, well-being of uh, rice farmers and rice consumers, taking into account that increasing productivity of the rice paddy today uh, uh, requires that any measures that are taken assures that the paddies of the future will also be productive. So environmental sustainability is a key element. And an institute like ours uh, uh, can only do as much uh, uh, through partnership. Uh, it's very, very uh, important that we engage, and as Sahara mentioned, we've got offices in, in 17 or 18 countries around the world, activities in, in, in many more. So that's a very key uh, part of our, of our approach. We are a member of the CGIAR uh, centers. Uh, three centers have programs on, on rice, uh, and we've met, uh, joined together to form uh, the Global Rice Science Partnership. And the work that I'm talking about today is encompassed within that global partnership strategy. Well, 
what is rice besides being tasty? Uh, I think it is perhaps the oldest domesticated crop. It is unbelievably diverse genetically, and I'll talk about that in, in, in a bit. Uh, but it is more than just a food. Although it is the staple for most of the world's poor, it is embedded in societies and cultures across Asia in ways that most of us can barely begin to appreciate. And that colors many of the approaches that, that, that farmers take and policymakers take. And I'll try to come back to that, uh, to that uh, issue. A very important part about rice is that it flourishes in the monsoonal environment. Half the year over much of the world, the environment is not very suitable for most of our major crops. Torrential rainfalls, uh, uh, stagnant uh, water on the soils would wipe out a maize or a wheat or a cassava. Okay, rice, on the other hand, flourishes. It's very happy being up to its knees in, in water, and uh, thank you very much. So uh, rice will be around for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, it's also grown by very small farmers. The vast majority, overwhelming majority of farmers are uh, small, a couple of hectares at most, it's considered a decent sized farm, a lot of animal power, reliance on human labor, but there's going to be some major pressures on how rice has grown when you consider what's happening with the economies in Asia in particular. Will people be satisfied working as day laborers in a rice paddy uh, uh, over the next generation? Uh, the answer is no, they won't. And so there will be changes uh, that will have to take place. Um, I mentioned that, that rice permeates the cultures of Asian societies. And that was something that I've been talking about because I'd sensed over, over the years of really how deeply uh, decisions around rice policy, et cetera, take place. So I was really gratified to see this paper come out in Science uh, last May, where it talked about the rice culture, that those who communities, those societies wherein rice is the major source of food are organized differently than those cultures that depend upon uh, annual crops like wheat or maize. The amount of social investment that's required to grow rice, irrigation schemes, drainage schemes, et cetera, transplanting a crop by hand requires pooling of labor, et cetera, permeate through a society and help build its values. And, I, and this was quantified in quite a striking, uh, quite a striking uh, uh, illustration to me about how, when we think about how technologies will change, how uh, policies might adapt, that we have to take into account this very, very deep uh, uh, role of the rice culture. And, um, you know, and, and it's passed on from generation to generation. And you know, long after a family no longer cultivates rice, it still carries, like all cultures, carries with it that rice culture. And I was really gratified because it wasn't me just waving my arms saying, saying that rice is different, but uh, at least I've got something in, published in science. Um, the area is famous uh, for leading the green revolution in rice in, in Asia, and it did transform. Uh, Asian uh, uh, agriculture. In the 60s, yields were very low, a ton and a half per hectare. Today, almost three times increase in, in yield has left, led really to major transformations in, uh, in Asian economies. And one, it, to make a very solid argument, and people do, that the economic miracle that took place in Asia was built on a foundation of abundant and affordable and reliable rice supplies. And I think that's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, and the, trend, the Green Revolution was built on changing the plant's architecture. It was a science-driven approach. That is, people got together, asked the question, what do we need to do to change the rice plant so that it will go from a ton and a half to four or five tons uh, at, in, on farm fields? Uh, at the time, if you added fertilizer to the rice, it just grew tall, grew more leaves, and fell over, and your yields were actually lower. Uh, so our scientists redesigned the rice plant, semi-dwarf. You added fertilizer. It added more grain rather than leaves and, uh, and stems. And that, I believe, was a great example of demonstrating that science could do what people did not believe was possible. Back in the 60s, Paul Ehrlich and colleagues 
were arguing that there was no hope for Asia, that the future was in Africa, that Asia was a basket case, forget it, would not never be able to feed itself. Well, we proved them wrong. And it's been a steady progress of technologies. I won't go into it, but it wasn't a silver bullet. Many, many uh, activities and, 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 and contributions in plant protection, better crop management, fertilizer, pest management, et cetera, have gone to continually raise uh, uh, production levels in, uh, in, in, in the world, in rice. Now, if we look at the production of, uh, of or consumption, I'm sorry, of rice around the world. You see here the darker areas are, are the uh, per capita, uh, increasing per capita consumption, darkest over 75 kilograms per person per year. That's a very large amount of rice. People eating rice two, three, four, five times uh, a day. And it's not, not surprising, concentrated in, in, in South and Southeast Asia, but note the increasing importance of rice in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and also in, in Latin America. When you superimpose poverty statistics on that, each dot represents a quarter of a million people living on less than a dollar and a quarter a day, it's clear that, in my mind anyway, that any effort to address large-scale rural poverty, particularly, but also urban poverty, uh, will have to take rice into a, into a, a part of the part of the equation. Uh, now, when we talk about poverty, it's not just a dollar and a quarter a day. And this, this struck me when I was uh, traveling in, in, in uh, western, northwestern Bangladesh, came across a field where there were these piles of dirt out in the, in the field. And I asked my colleague what, what was there. And he said, come on out, it'd be kind of interesting. So we went out into the field and looked at this these holes that were dug in the rice fields after after the harvest. And I don't know if you can see it back, there's a little tube here in the ground. But what that was, he explained, was that after the harvest, the very poor in the village go out and look for the rat's nests by finding a hole in the top of the ground. And they dig out the rat's nest and they steal the grain from the rats. And I thought that, to me, really communicated what real poverty was, if you're fighting with the rats for your food. And of course, the consequences of poverty, malnutrition, and all of the cascading impact of that. That's really what we're talking about. So we're talking about dealing with poverty. We're talking about uh, live, lifestyles and future generations. And I think it's always important to keep, to keep that in mind. And also where poverty is. In China, we all think of Shanghai and Beijing and the Olympics and all of that. But if you remember that map of poverty, China was pretty densely covered with poverty dots, right? And this was a, 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 a picture on the cover of the what was then International Herald Tribune in May of 2013. And I was really struck. This is from Yunnan, China. And this is a fam typical rural family, obviously very poor. But I just wanted you to note that the one appliance they have is a rice cooker. So there's that, uh, there's that evidence that if it's... <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to have some spare, spare, spare money, make sure we can cook our rice uh, well. And global rice per capita consumption is going, it has been stable for the past 25 years. The conventional wisdom was that as income rise, people will eat less rice, and rice will be less important, and you don't have to worry about meeting global rice supplies. But, in fact, supplies uh, per capita consumption has remained the same. So if nothing else, population growth will continue to drive rice consumption worldwide. You look at sub-Saharan Africa, it, it, rice consumption is the fastest growing uh, 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 food in the, in the region. Um, it is expected that in about 10 to 20 years, rice will replace maize as the staple in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and if, if in the next 10 years we are successful in our plans or our efforts to double rice production in sub-Saharan Africa, in 10 years they'll still be importing the same amount of rice they are today. So the, con the consumption demand is enormous. And that's summarized here. You can see this is what we're projecting out. We're revising this. This is a, 
a, a prediction we made in uh, 2010. Uh, we're revising that. The numbers are going up. The demand is increasing more than we than anticipated back then. Uh, red is, is Asia, blue is Africa, and you can see that the demand from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa increasing quite, uh, quite substantially. And climate change. No joke, it will hit rice particularly hard. We've got temperatures, rainfall patterns uh, changing. You're all aware of that, sea level rise and weather hazards. All of these conspire particularly to hit rice, and I'll talk about uh, why and how, what we're doing about that in, in a few minutes. So where is the world's rice going to come from? OK, we've got a very heavy demand. Everything tells us we need more. Most, the vast majority of the world's lands that are suitable for rice production, certainly in Asia, are already being cultivated uh, to rice. Uh, so we're going to have to increase the productivity on our existing lands. But if you look at what's happening in Asia in terms of urban growth, urban sprawl, land use patterns, et cetera. Land is moving out of rice. Labor is moving out of rice. If you have a chance to be up to your knees transplanting rice in the mud or working in a semiconductor manufacturing fa factory, I can tell you what job you're going to pick. OK, so there's labor constraints. And water. Competition for water is extremely important. Uh, if a government is faced with the choice of providing water for, for example, Metro Manila, 20 million people or more, or a rice irrigation scheme in central Luzon, I can tell you what they're going to pick. All that water will always go to the urban before it goes to rural uses. And we see that pressure across, across Asia. So there will have to be major changes in production practices just to stay where we are. And where we are, if you look at those poverty statistics, and certainly the associated nutrition is not good enough. And I just want to highlight that if Asia is food insecure, the world is food insecure. Now, Africa will come on board probably 20 years from now to produce more and more rice, but we've got a lot of uh, ground to catch up until then. So I think, and this probably comes as no surprise, that we'd another, we need another green revolution. I'll argue that that second green revolution has already begun, but it has to be even more science-based than, than the first one. And by science-based, I mean we have to systematically tap into the simultaneous revolutions that have been taking place around us in, 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 in plant biology, genetics, genomics. Um, we need to be able to link what's happening in the soil, the soil biology, soil chemistry, with overall system performance. And we have the tools now to begin to do that. Believe it or not, we can take a cup of mud from a rice paddy and essentially pour it into a DNA sequencer and get an idea of what the component of the microbiota or microflora is in that rice paddy, which is a major determinant in how nutrient availability transpires over time. So a lot of, 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 of uh, opportunities there. The computation and communications uh, uh, revolution is essential to being able to make sense out of all of our genomics data, our uh, uh, systems analyses, et cetera. So we have an intertwining set of, of, of revolutions that are taking place that will enable us to address questions to a degree of sophistication that were really undreamt of just a decade or so ago. And the key, though, in my opinion, and this I came to this conclusion as a scientist, it was a very difficult thing to swallow. If we're going to have anything make a difference, our policymakers are going to have to understand the potential and the need that our technologies offer and address. And we're going to have to be able to communicate effectively to our, to our policymakers. So let me talk a little bit about the actual science. We'll talk about first uh, genetic resources. I mentioned that rice is unbelievably genetically diverse. Um, probably multiple uh, domestication events is actually probably still going on in farmers' fields today, unlike our other staples. We hold in trust at Erie a gene bank that has 100 and, uh, over 117,000 different rice varieties. That is how complex. Farmers have selected over the millennia an enormous array. But very little of that has been used in our breeding programs, but we did, in cooperation with uh, China, 
uh, Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences and Beijing Genomics Institute last May uh, released the sequence, the full DNA sequence of 3,000 rice lines from that gene bank. When I joined URI as DG in 2005, the cover page of Science Magazine was the sequencing of one genome of rice. Cover page, big deal. Beautiful photograph, if you remember it. Now we did 3,000. And we're in the process of doing a, 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 a target. Next target is 10,000 so that we fully sample the genetic diversity of the rice species. And we're using those sequences in a, in, in a systematic way to identify function and, and, and how uh, that, those genetic traits can be manipulated to improve the rice, rice crop. A major effort involved in understanding what that sequence means, a global effort to characterize these sequence lines for every trait you can imagine. High throughput phenotyping, we call it. But that's the key to it. Sequence by itself is very interesting for an evolutionary biologist in Harvard, but without uh, plant performance data in the field, it's almost useless to a plant breeder. So that's a, the, the steps we're taking forward on that. And we get just gorgeous descriptions of, of what the rice species look like, breaking down into various subgroups, telling us where it was evolved and selected, guiding us to, if we're looking for particular traits, where we can go. Uh, the Aus varieties here, for example, are, are pocketed, they're domesticated to subspecies in eastern India and some areas where, where, where environments are particularly tough. And we find in there sources of tolerance to drought and, and flooding, much more frequently than you'd say in the Japonicas, where in North Asia you don't have those kinds of issues. So helping us understand and target our work more, more effectively. So some of the traits we're going to be looking for, we are looking for, have found uh, 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 that will be particularly important in our changing climates are drought, flood tolerance, heat tolerance, and, and salt tolerance. Keeping in mind that rice grows in delta areas, and deltas are by definition at sea level, you are going to have, with any sea level rise, stronger storm surges, an increasing problem with, with salt in, in, in rice production. So let's look at the rice deltas for a minute. We got about 50% of the growth of rice production in Asia has come from the delta countries, particularly vulnerable. So we have to be paid particular attention uh, to these. And where you have uh, most of the lowland rice in, in, in the world, you have a lot of your tendency to flooding. Uh, modern irrigation schemes try to uh, uh, mitigate the probability of flooding, but over much of the world's rain-fed areas, we call them, particularly in South Asia and the inland valleys of Africa, flooding is very common. We lose tens of millions of hectares of rice every year to floods. Um, and uh, although, as I said, rice likes to grow up to its knees in water, if it goes completely underwater, it will drown like any other plant. So dealing with floods, almost paradoxically, is one of the main issues we have to look at in, uh, in rice. And even a short-term flood can, can be a problem. Well, our scientists did identify tolerance in flooding from our gene bank uh, uh, a number of years ago. And it took quite a long time to transfer the flood tolerance to a variety that farmers would like. We, have, we, could, we could do the crosses, and we could do the improvement, and we could get flood tolerance into a rice variety. But there were so many other terrible traits associated with it, low yield, uh, very poor grain quality. That, that uh, one, one, one person told me that after tasting that flood tolerant, the early flood tolerant varieties, that this rice is so bad the dog wouldn't eat it. And so anyway, so that's no good. So basically, uh, it took the, the development of the tools of molecular biology, marker-assisted breeding, to allow us to transfer the gene for flood tolerance into rice varieties that farmers would grow. And here's a great slide. This is uh, a set of varieties in, in, in yellow, or actually in white, that have had the flood tolerance gene transferred to them. And those are shown in, in yellow. And uh, this was after 
this pond, this is at Erie, being completely underwater for 17 days. If you can imagine a flood where the standing water is more than two weeks above a crop field, and then when that, those flood waters recede, you actually get a crop that recovers. You've got a better imagination than me. Because that is an enormous insult to a crop to be, to be, uh, to be flooded, be completely submerged that long. <clears throat> but here you can see those varieties with the flood tolerant gene came back and grew very nicely. And this slide I really like because it, re it, it, it reinforces my decision in undergraduate school not to focus too much on statistics because you don't really need a robust statistical analysis to tell you which ones are doing better than, uh, than the others. But we took this out to Farmer's Field. This was, this was back in 2005, 2006 at Erie when things were looking pretty good, but the acid test, of course, is in Farmer's Field. So we took this out to South Asia in, um, in, in the Faisabad district in UP in, in, in eastern India. Planted this out, this is 2008. This is uh, Mr. Asharam Pal. And this field had, this had been exposed to two floods. And this is what his field looked like. This is the flood tolerant rice, and this is how it looks after a flood. And his neighbors were telling him he should just plow it up. He's not going to get anything from that field. And we said, no, come on, hang on. Just work with us here and give it a chance to come back. And this is what that field looked like July 31st. So out in a farmer's field, exposed to real world floods, we get this kind of, of, of recovery. And working with USAID, Gates Foundation, Government of India, uh, Government of Japan, by 2015, we expect to reach 5 million farmers. We hit 4 million farmers of seed distribution in, at the end of, uh, end of last year, which is a, a quite a phenomenal achievement. We're moving it, obviously, in Bangladesh and Nepal, other areas where floods are good and also are, are important, also moving to sub-Saharan Africa for the inland, uh, inland valleys. And um, I go out on a limb, and I'll say that the second green revolution actually began uh, July 31st at 1.17 in the afternoon, 2008, when Mr. Paul did not plow in that field showed the courage to try the new technology. And the efforts behind getting a flood tolerant rice out to scale is something that can't be um, understated. We started with 10 kilos of seed in 2006 in India, a bag of seed you can hold in one hand, to get that multiplied up and distributed to millions of farmers requires quite a commitment and an investment. And it required the engagement of, of the national research system, but then the national seed system, the agriculture. The government of India, when we took senior people out to show them what this technology meant in these environments, they were stunned and bought into it uh, immediately. And so we've actually, uh, uh, through the engagement of the Government of India, National Food Security Mission, as well as the private sector, becoming excited about finally having something new in rice for these difficult environments, we've been able to move this seed quite, uh, quite substantially. And something else that, that really struck me, uh, and I've been working in these rain-fed difficult environments since uh, the late 80s, early, early 90s, they target those regions where stresses are the most severe, floods and droughts. And we would always say we we're working for the world, for the poorest of the poor, et cetera. But it really struck me when uh, uh, Alan de Genvry, who's a very well-known ag economist out of Berkeley, sent a team to do an analysis of the impact of this work in eastern India. And the concluding paragraph makes this statement that literally gave me goosebumps when I read it. It said, this study indicates that scheduled castes are likely to be a major beneficiary from the spread of Swarna sub-1 in India. The scheduled castes are the untouchables. These are the lowest of the low in the totem pole. They get the world's, the, the worst land in the village. But these are the people who will differentially benefit 
from the application of some of the most powerful tools of molecular biology. I mean, think about that. I mean, that is, it, is, it is an amazing feat that we are actually now able to develop technologies that will hit these toughest areas and benefit the, the poorest of the poor. And drought, flood's not the only thing that bothers them. They got drought is, 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 is a, serious, a serious issue that we expect. And we are developing drought-tolerant varieties that are performing uh, quite well, uh, a yield advantage of, of, of a ton to a, almost a ton and a half, in some cases, in severe to moderate drought. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a difference between having at least enough rice to eat or having to sell off your livestock or, or, or pour your kids out of school. So we're seeing major progress in, in that stress as well. And oddly enough, we're able to combine flood tolerance and drought tolerance. Now, one would think, how can that be? Now, what's, what's the, 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 the really uh, difficult part that the people face in some of these, these uh, environments, uh, rice growing environments in, in Asia and sub-Saharan Africa, is that they might get hit by a flood one part of the year. The same year, they can get hit by a drought. So they can have a flood and a drought. And so having only a flood tolerant line or only a drought tolerant line in some years isn't enough. So we've been able to combine the flood and drought tolerance into single varieties. And that seems like almost a contradiction in terms, but physiologically they have completely different mechanisms and completely different genetic uh, pathways. So actually it turns out that it's much easier than any of us, uh, any of us thought it would be. And that will be, I think, a major a major uh, uh, transformational force as well. So what we're seeing is a set of traits that are coming along. Drought tolerance, flood tolerance. And let's think about heat. Rice is already growing near its thermal maximum at about 33 degrees. If, about, if, if temperatures exceed that during flowering, then the rice grains are sterile. So I only need a couple of hours of peak temperature right at flowering and rice flowers at noon, not near the hottest time of the day, so it doesn't seem like a very good strategy. So any, any even moderate rise in temperature will be problematic for rice. So we've looked for years and years and years to try to find tolerance to, to, to high temperatures, uh, and nothing was there. Uh, so we thought maybe it's just better to, 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 to just run away, as my friends in West Africa say. And by running away, what that means is in looking through our gene bank, we found rices that flower at 8 o'clock in the morning. So you can have a hot day, but if your flowering is done by 9 o'clock in the morning, you're not going to worry about that high temperature. It's just a very narrow window of susceptibility. So here's a rice variety. These little things are, are, uh, are anthers sticking out. This is a rice in full flower, 8.30 in the morning, normal rice variety, hasn't even woken up yet. And we have simple tool, a simple trait like this should enable us to, uh, to, avoid, to avoid the heat tolerance. And just the last word on, on the, how we use the gene bank. Um, we're also conserving traditional varieties. And we've, we've linked up with an NGO to, uh, called Eighth Wonder that will take the rices from the beautiful Philippine rice terraces in Banaui and market them in Washington, D.C., in Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Oregon, or Seattle, Washington, at 10 to 20 times market price. So um, these farmers can get some benefit from their, their hard work. And, if we can, and they're organic, too. So we can, you know, they're organic, they're tribal, they're everything. And so people will pay a fortune for them, which is great, I think. Now, the wild species. I was going to talk about. Uh, the dinosaur extinction and that sort of thing, but it would take too much time. But basically, rice is domesticated for a number, from a number of wild relatives. And uh, it's a pretty closely linked set of species. And we have, uh, a, over the years, identified quite a few traits that are in these wild relatives that are not in domesticated rice. And uh, our scientists have done an incredible amount of work over the past 30 years to, develop, to make crosses among these wild relatives that look like weeds growing by the side of the road. 
but have valuable traits in them. And the reason they look like weeds growing by side of the road, because they probably are. If you drive through a road in wet monsoonal southeast days, you'll see these guys. But they carry great traits. And But the uh, uh, our, our breeders have been able to make crosses using conventional means to get traits from these rice varieties into uh, into a uh, suitable uh, rice variety for farmers to, to grow. And here's an example. This is uh, this is uh, a modern rice variety here in no water, in normal irrigation water. This is um, the same variety growing in in water that's about half the concentration of salt of seawater. This is uh, a wild relative, Ariza caracata, that's growing in that same concentration. Quite happy. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a cross between this and this and tolerating the, the salinity very well, and this is a later generation. So basically, we've been able to transfer a high level of salt tolerance of a, of a, of a wild relative of rice that grows in uh, mangrove areas into a, a rice background that a farmer would grow. So in these areas of coastal areas where we have saltwater intrusion, particularly during the dry season, you have floods uh, uh, from typhoons, etc. salinity, which limits rice production will no longer be uh, a limiting factor. So it could be a major tool in helping us deal with the impact of, of, of climate change. Of course, some traits are not found in, uh, uh, in, in, in wild rice or even its uh, rice or even its wild relatives. Uh, rice is very low content of vitamin A or, uh, or, or beta carotene. Uh, the reason being that rice can synthesize its own beta or vitamin A whenever it needs it, and, uh, uh, and so it doesn't carry it in the seed. Uh, but it is a deficiency. It, vitamin A deficiency is very serious in rice-consuming countries, particularly. We've got hundreds of millions of people who suffer vitamin A deficiency around the world. Um, drastic, catastrophic impacts of, of blindness and, and immune system uh, uh, suppression, etc., uh, as a result of vitamin A deficiency. And there's a <clears throat> effort that began back in 1984 to develop rice that would create or would carry beta carotene in its grain. Beta carotene is converted by the human body into vitamin A. Uh, that uh, also confers a yellow pigmentation, so the grain is 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 yellow. It's been called golden rice, uh, and we are working on adapting the golden rice, the, the 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 trait into varieties that will be high enough yielding, productive enough for farmers to grow and get that into uh, into the consumer stream. Um, it's been a uh, much more difficult process than any of us thought at the beginning, uh, uh, including have, what all you have to do to get through regulatory approval because it is a transgenic crop or a GMO. One of the questions when golden rice was created, at first the prototype came out in the early 90s, one question was, can it produce sufficient vitamin A equivalents in beta carotene? to make a nutritional difference. And Greenpeace had a field day with us, because the first golden rice materials that came out, the proof of concept, had very low beta carotene content, that would, so very low vitamin A equivalency in it. And they pretty much ridiculed us, saying that this GMO is no good, because this is how much, gold, this is how much rice you would have to eat for a child to get enough, get enough golden rice, of course, or get enough vitamin A. Of course, the problem is they didn't recognize that this was a prototype technology. It wasn't the finished product. And through quite a bit of work of, uh, of, of, of tweaking the systems, et cetera, uh, we have actually been able to up the content of uh, beta carotene in golden rice such that if a child eats 50 grams, a normal serving of rice and golden rice, they would have uh, more than half of their daily 
uh, intake requirement for, for vitamin A. So basically, it could be a normal part of any diet uh, to, uh, to, uh, to meet uh, vitamin A uh, needs. Now, this has been a real challenge, and it will continue to be a challenge, because we have uh, regulatory procedures we have to go through. We have to go through um, uh, regular varietal approvals, et cetera. And then there's the hurdle of public relations and, and, and moving a GMO. And that's going to be a tremendous, and it continues to be, a tremendous learning process for us. Now, all that work about breeding, I, I said that one of the key is to have effective partnerships. We have decentralized breeding activities in Africa, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and I don't show it here, and in, um, in uh, South America through the Global Rice Science Partnership, where materials are moving very effectively around the world in partnership with national systems and increasingly the private sector. All right, now, a variety isn't everything. You have to be able to manage your crop properly to get a decent yield out of it. I'll just give you a couple examples of, of, of water management, nutrient management. Water, while rice loves water, it does end up using quite a bit of water in, in, in Asia. Uh, about half, almost half the water used in Asia goes to rice production. Now, that's a lot of river water that wouldn't be used for anything else, but still a pretty phenomenal amount. Uh, and there's increasing pressure to use water more efficiently. And so uh, and we're expecting pretty significant shortages over the next couple of decades in uh, water availability. And we have a number of water-saving options that we're working on uh, in terms of uh, intermittent irrigation, uh, growing rice more like wheat, et cetera, all of which can reduce water use dramatically in rice. However, it's not as simple an uh, issue of, well, just use less irrigation water. Because what happens is, as you change the amount of water that's used in growing rice, the soil chemistry changes. The uh, environment for, in which pests and pathogens live changes. Um, the weed comp composition in the field changes. So there's a huge if I can say, can of worms that's opened up because nematodes can become a problem. Um, that you have to address as soon as you start to monkey with something so fundamental as the water supply of a rice field. But it's a reality. And that's why we have research institutions. Now, nutrient management. Those of you who are aware of, of some of the issues around intensive uh, nutrient management in, 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 in Asia, particularly nitrate pollution of groundwater in southern China, realizes that's a problem. We started looking uh, quite closely over a period of about 15 years at how farmers are managing nutrients and how we can adjust this nutrient management and developed uh, some very quick and easy tools uh, you can see here that, that, uh, that farmers uh, did not adopt in large numbers. Uh, there was cumbersome that spoke scientific language, etc. And gradually over the years, We've come to realize the tools that we offer for farmers to make decisions will have to be something they're comfortable with. And increasingly, farmers are comfortable with cell phones, oddly enough. And so we have developed very sophisticated decision-making tools that farmers can access using a cell phone. And this isn't a push kind of thing that says, apply 25 kg of N. No, it, asks, it goes into a discussion with the farmer. What rice variety are you growing? What uh, did you grow last year? Uh, are you irrigated or are you rain-fed? Are you using uh, uh, well water or river water? All these things that come together to allow a farmer to make a much more intelligent decision about nutrients. And we found that in Indonesia, we can increase farmer income by about $100 a year using this, which is pretty significant. But more importantly, we realized that farmers are willing to access all kinds of information through their phones, not just nutrient management, but also crop protection, uh, market information that we all know about. And we're looking at putting together a platform, a crop management platform, that would not be farmer by farmer, but would actually form the basis of 
business models for entrepreneurs and, and crop, man uh, crop management advisors uh, in rice growing areas that would allow them to offer suites of management options to, to rice farmers and eventually connect to the credit markets and possibly then, as credit risks drop, connect to the insurance market, crop insurance. So if we can have documented adoption by farmers of best practices, their credit risk drops, their suitability for insurance increases, and we might crack one of those, those nuts that, that, have, that have threatened us. And that brings me to our stakeholders. We pay, at the end of the day, as I've hopefully come across, farmers are increasingly, are really the ultimate users of our, of our technologies. And we opened a, 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 a regional African, East African hub in Burundi, and working with women, rice, uh, women who, when the peace accords were signed in Burundi, people who turned in a weapon were given a job or given cash or given some sort of compensation to reintegrate into society. The women who cooked for the rebels in the camps didn't have a, we a weapon to turn in, and they were out of luck. So we started working with these women, uh, getting them into cooperatives to grow rice seed. Rice is becoming very popular in Burundi. And this quote just struck me. That was talking with one woman. He said, my family were eating only once a day. Now we eat twice a day. And she was ecstatic. And that's the level of poverty we're talking about. But we can have impact with these kinds of people. Finally, a quick word on policies. I said that I came the hard road to understand that policymakers uh, have to understand the opportunities uh, offered by, by technology. So we, we need to be able to plan for what's coming down the road. Uh, understand what, right, how much rice is going to be grown where and when. We're going to talk about supplies, availability, food security strategies. Uh, and we're doing a lot of work on remote sensing and crop growth modeling to work with us. And we're using uh, uh, satellite imagery, radar, cloud penetrating satellites to map in exquisite detail the distribution of rice production uh, around, around Asia first and eventually worldwide. Uh, it's cloud penetrating radar. I, I won't go through it uh, in, in any detail. But the idea is that in a monsoonal environment, if you're using standard optical satellite imagery, all you will see for the entire growth growing season is clouds, which don't help you very much. But radar imagery bounces, passes through the clouds and through some very great uh, uh, manipulation of algorithms on, uh, on the imagery, we can predict with extreme accuracy the area of, of, of rice that's planted and are connecting with crop growth models we can predict the yield. And so we can do all kinds of, of, uh, of, of work with, uh, with remote sensing linked with our knowledge of the crop and crop growth models to give policymakers a real-time idea of what rice production is going to be compared to what you can get from FAO tables, which will tell you what rice production was two years ago, uh, or USDA models, no offense, that uh, depend on someone calling up and saying, what do you think the rice yield is this year? And just as an example, in the Mekong, uh, this is the very fine, we're down to about three meters resolution. Uh, green shows the area. The colored areas show the planting date. Planting date is one of the key determinants of yield, day length and expected cloud cover. Connecting with crop models, uh, we can actually give a very, very accurate yield projections, and we can adjust yield estimates uh, every couple of weeks as satellites fly, uh, fly over. And those are just yield estimates uh, uh, down to a, a field level, which is, which is really quite, quite astounding. Also, incidentally, these satellite imagery allows us to get a, an idea of what happens in, in disaster. Typhoon Haiyan that devastated uh, uh, southern Philippines in 2013. There it is. Uh, FAO, not banging FAO, but came out saying because of the storm, you know, thousands and thousands of tons of rice were lost. We were able to get our satellite, get access to our satellite imagery, 
Blue is where the floods were. Green is where rice fields are. The rice fields were not flooded. And then, by the way, we told the Secretary of Agriculture the rice, according to our satellite imagery, was 95% harvested three weeks before the storm anyway. So basically, no losses. But much better ability even to deal with, with disasters. So we're looking at, in addition to developing our technologies to, to improve productivity of rice, production of rice, provide the information so that decision makers can put together intelligent policies that will respond to the realities of, of production and shifting uh, production in ways that uh, uh, can help them uh, design policies that will benefit broader society, taking into account the needs of both the rural and the urban sector. So as we look to the future, you know, it's, I'm an optimist. We've got a great set of technologies come along that will allow us to address some of the biggest challenges facing us. A lot of changes will be taking place within the rice markets and the rice systems, but we can adapt to them. There's going to be great demand for those. And that notwithstanding, uh, catastrophic losses will, be, will occasionally occur. And we're developing tools that not only will allow us to deal with challenges facing day-to-day -day rice production, but also uh, catastrophes that we expect to, to, to face us. And just want to remind you of the Chinese saying that the precious things in life are not pearls and jade, but the five grains of which rice is indeed the finest. So with that, thank you very much. And happy to take questions. And for those of you who don't want to work in a, or are tired sometimes of working in a bureaucracy, like to make take a break and come out and work with uh, us in, in, in the Philippines, we have lots of uh, uh, postdoctoral positions and that sort of thing available for, for young scientists, et cetera. So, all right. Thank you so much, Bob. A really yeah. fantastic presentation. Um, and we'll open up to questions. We have about half an hour or so for questions. I just wanted to quickly flag for those of you, um, in case anyone has to leave early, there's a survey on your chairs um, or that will be shared uh, on the <laughs> webinar. And it's just always helpful for us to um, have these, whether or not you've attended events before, you can just leave them on your chairs or leave them on the table out there. Um, all right, so we traditionally often take a question from online, from our webinar audience, as the first question. So why don't we do that, and then we'll come back to the in-person audience. Thank you, Julie. I've got a couple questions about specific rice varieties from Sambakawa in Liberia. Are you also working on rice that does equally well in salty mangroves and in freshwater lowlands, like you did for drought and flooded conditions? And for marketability, any mention of rice in sub-Saharan Africa that's resistant to milling breakage? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I probably went over a little bit fast. I was conscious of time. But yeah, we are specifically working on, on incorporating uh, very high levels of salt tolerance uh, in um, uh, in, in rice, in, in commercializable rice varieties, if, uh, if fresh water has electric conductivity of zero and seawater has electrical conductivity of, of uh, around low 50s, uh, uh, mangroves will be around mid 20s to 30s. We're developing rices that will grow happily in about uh, electric or EC levels of uh, 30 to 35 which is very salty, uh, so that's uh, in mangrove areas. I do want to make sure that uh, we don't, that as salt tolerant varieties are developed, that mangrove swamps aren't cleared to grow rice, because that's, that would be an ecological problem, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, but the, still, the salt tolerance is something very important in, in these areas. The uh, head rice cover recovery, or milling recovery, or milling breakage, is a big problem with rice. Uh, uh, one of the nightmares of breeders is to, is to develop a high yielding rice that when it is polished, it breaks apart into crumbs. Uh, uh, rice, as my picture of the rice grain showed, people like to eat whole grains. Okay, and the way it feels in the mouth and all of that are very important. 
Wheat, you grind up, and maize, you grind up pretty much into a flour, so it doesn't matter what happens when you process it. Rice, it's very important that the grain remain intact. And there is quite a bit of uh, variation within rice in its ability to tolerate polishing. And uh, so we, are pay, we pay a lot of attention to rice that, that, that stays intact, and that's a very important trait. A question here in person. You got one? And um, if you wouldn't mind sharing your name and organization as well. Hi, I'm Dr. Noemi Vogrosin. I uh, got my PhD at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And uh, I did my research <coughs> on uh, uh, African rice, Oriza glaberima, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, how the genetic diversity of Oriza glaberima is uh, related to environmental variables in Benin, mm -hmm. West Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you very much for your presentation. But I haven't really uh, uh, heard you talk about Oriza glaberima much. And uh, we all know that Oriza glaberima is the second uh, species that is uh, domesticated, but it's also really endemic to West Africa. But uh, I would like to know what your organization is doing to to um, make Oriza glaberima as uh, known as uh, uh, Oriza sativa, because Oriza sativa is grown all over, the, is grown worldwide, yeah. whereas Oriza sativa is grown only. Uh, in West uh, Africa, yeah. but Oriza Glaberima uh, has uh, a lot of uh, uh, really great characteristic mm -hmm. that might be used sure. uh, yeah. helpful to to yeah. no, that's to, a, that's a, for uh, varieties. So yeah. what what yeah. what what does your organization yeah. is doing to 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 help great. with that? Yeah, we're and we're actually doing quite a bit. We're we're working with Africa Rice in in Benin. Uh, uh, the main thrust uh, of of both our work is is to take the traits of of, of Ariza glaberima. It's one of the relatives of of rice, and it, as as she indicated, was domesticated independently in in West Africa. Uh, uh, river uh, uh, areas or swampy areas. Uh, it has many traits, and we are we are doing interspecific crosses uh, across the rise of glaberima and the rise of sativa to move traits into from glaberima into sativa. And the question of actually a breeding program to improve glaberima that's more in the in the uh, in the arena of of Africa Rice Institute. We ourselves are not are not doing that, but in all honesty, almost all the focus is on moving traits from glaberima into sativa rather than improving uh, glaberima itself. Yeah, we've got a couple of related questions. What, the first is from Madeline Smith. Uh, can you talk a bit more on the behavior change research focused on the acceptance, market approaches, or incentives, et cetera, to increase the uptake at scale of golden rice? And the related question is from Roma Rozinski from Boca University in Vienna, Austria. I wonder about the societal acceptance of golden rice, since rice is such a key element of cultures in Southeast Asia. Do housewives and kids like it? Any experiences? Yeah, I think we've, we've um, there are two uh, components to the acceptance. One is, uh, I suppose there are three. Uh, one component is is taste. Is there any taste difference from from golden rice? A second would be its appearance. Is there anything about the golden color, yellow color, that would put people off? And then the third is, uh, for some, it being a GMO. Uh, the, uh, we've done studies uh, with golden rice um, uh, taste panels under uh, red light where white rice and yellow rice are indistinguishable and there have been no, uh, 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 no, no, no taste differences. The, um, the appearance, all of our, our surveys indicate that uh, whether rice is is yellow or not, uh, if it's not off-colored brown like it's gone moldy, if it's just a nice clear yellow, people find no problem with it. Matter of fact, they're intrigued by it. And if you go to just about any market, 
in Asia, you will find rice that is already colored yellow, saffron. So it's not outside the, the norm to eat a yellow rice. And that's something. So uh, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, our uh, research into acceptability, et cetera, around uh, the color yellow indicates that uh, with a little bit of, of, uh, of um, uh, public awareness about the health benefit of golden rice, we're not expecting uh, that uh, much resistance there. The issue around uh, GMO, um, again, it's going to be a communications issue. Uh, once golden rice passes all the regulatory uh, uh, processes, uh, there is no safety or health issues. It's a question of what sort of propaganda the anti-GMO lobby will launch. Uh, and that's something that uh, you know, we're obviously thinking about and how best to deal with that. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where you're saying that it's a, it's not a it's 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 a very challenging prospect to think about how to deal with the anti-GMO lobby because they're one they don't they're not constrained by facts or truth uh, so that makes it easy for them and then you don't want to be in a situation of of denying something you know no I don't beat my dog sort of thing you know what I mean. Uh, you can, you, so it's 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 uh, we've actually we have a lot of work going into this in communications development and that sort of thing, but we really don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because we want to make sure we have a a product that farmers will grow and that will be productive enough uh, before we get in too much into the uh, uh, into the communications. And I'm frankly uh, disappointed, honestly, by a lot of the work that our friends who are pro Golden rice go out and make a lot of noise about it, and we don't have a product that's ready yet. And to be quite honest, I mean that's and, uh, and so people are getting all their expectations up, and we're saying, well, you know, hang on, uh, it's going to take a while. And it's just the nuts and bolts of getting a rice variety that will yield enough that farmers will grow and get a decent income. Nothing to do with anything about golden rice per se. It's just the rice breeding challenge in general. Uh, my first question is okay. Uh, my first question, and I'm John McMurdy from here at USA. Mm -hmm. uh, my first question is on the, the trajectory of hybrid rice mm -hmm. and you know, how that is or is expected to affect kind of rice seed systems. Yeah. Uh, my second question is, as long as we're talking about controversial things, um, USA has a, a few programs in its missions that is supporting SRI projects mm -hmm. as sort of rice intensification. Mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting to hear Erie's position on that. Sure. Yeah. Um, Hybrid rice is um, is something uh, obviously transformed rice production in China. It was government mandated technology. Um, hybrid rice in the tropics, uh, for various reasons that are not completely understood, doesn't perform as well as it does in in, in temperate areas. Uh, we are working, and many uh, we're working. We have a consortium of private and public to try to improve uh, the uh, uh, the uh, productivity of hybrid rice in uh, uh, in the tropics the private sector typically is not interested in the rice seed sector because uh, farmers can save their own seed and private sector is used to the model of hybrids where they sell seed every year and they have a guaranteed uh, revenue stream from their hybrid sales uh, and so the private sector is attracted to a hybrid rice model, but farmers don't really aren't really that attracted to hybrid rice because it just doesn't be quite honest. And some of my breeders would kill me, but if you look at the adoption rates of hybrids in India, where they've been pushed for for 20 years since the early 90s, uh, uh, the adoption rates were as and when you take away where there's a subsidy. Farmers aren't taking them up, and the farmers are not idiots. They're not going to take up a technology that's no good, or well, that doesn't provide for them a benefit that is uh, commensurate with the cost. Uh, I think that there is uh, uh, reason for uh, uh, optimism. We can we can uh, uh, 
develop uh, better hybrids, I believe, that, that are attractive to farmers, and I think they're of interest for a couple of reasons. One, it's much easier to manipulate traits with hybrids. You can actually, you have much more flexibility in varietal development with hybrids, so that's attractive. And frankly, the private sector, uh, I think, is needed to have a dynamic seed industry. And I'm working uh, with some companies to try to develop a, a viable seed model, or seed industry that doesn't demand hybrids, but it's a, it's a tough sell. Uh, so I, you know, I think that hybrids will play a, 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 a more important role in the future. But it's, again, it's, it's not a trivial thing. Uh, now, uh, SRI, that's the uh, uh, system of rice intensification, something that uh, was uh, developed by a Jesuit priest in Madagascar in the early 90s. I actually saw it when I visited Madagascar there in the early 90s. Uh, popularized by Norman Uphoff, uh, a guy I worship at his feet in terms of his communication skills. The Concept is a started out as a very rigid prescriptive approach to intensifying rice production. And I won't go into all the details, but it was a very strict recipe of what you need to do. And if you do this, you will get higher rice yields. Every component of SRI is known through classical agronomy work over the past 50 years to contribute to improved rice yields. That's never been a question. Uh, the question has always been around SRI is, well, with the one, one notable exception. You could not use mineral fertilizer. You could only use organic fertilizer, manure, or composted plant matter. Uh, the problems around SRI are not that if you do it the way you, you say you do it, you'll get higher yield. Nobody questions that. The question is, is it practical? I mean, the, many of the, of the restrictions are so strict that farmers don't or cannot adopt them. Labor demands are too high. Almost no farmer has enough animals to provide necessary nitrogen using manure alone. You have to be a very wealthy farmer to have that much manure. Labor required for weeding, hand weeding, you have to be a wealthy farmer. To control your, you, you need very, very precise control of water to be able to add water, remove water, add water. Almost every rice farmer, as soon as they get water on their field, the last thing they're going to do is take it off. Okay? And they've got the water, thank God, you know, and then take it off and put it on again. Uh, so it's the practical application of SRI that's the problem. And then the other issue that is just a major irritant to almost all of us is spectacular claims of outrageous yields of 20 tons a hectare, 25 tons a hectare. I mean, it's physiologically not possible. But, so, you know, the, but what I like about SRI, and I think that we need to take out of the positive page, out of many positive pages, out of the playbook, is that they have engaged NGOs and the, and the sectors and the government to go out and engage with farmers. And what's, what that means is that regardless, farmers are paying closer attention to their crop. And when farmers take up, you see these adoption figures of SRI, it's always modified SRI. It means they add a little nitrogen fertilizer, change the spacing. Well, we don't actually remove the water. We transplant uh, two or three seedlings instead of one, et cetera. But the point is, but they're paying close attention to agronomic practices that they weren't paying attention to before. And that is all for the better. So, any other questions? We'll shoot back to our online audience. This question comes from Duncan Bowden from Michigan State University at the Feed the Future Food Security Policy Innovation Lab. You mentioned that policy is important for technology uptake. What do you need policymakers to do, and what tools and communication channels do you find most effective in reaching them? Um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges um, around for policymakers, uh, well, there's a, a set. Um, one of the we've, we have in many different countries a lot of well-intentioned policies that I think are counterproductive in terms of subsidies for inputs, fertilizers, uh, subsidies for uh, irrigation water, etc. Uh, that lead to um, 
misuse of these inputs, and it's not they're not sustainable. So I think we need our policy our policymakers to take a hard look at their uh, incentives and what they're actually trying to incentivize. They all want you know enough right. I mean, if, if, if we like to say if the price of rice rises, ministers of agriculture fall. Uh, so all these policies around to try to keep people in their jobs at the political level, to put it crudely. Um, but I think a reassessment of, of our policies around inputs, and I would include the enforcement of pesticide regulations. We're seeing a resurgence of misuse of uh, particularly insecticides across rice growing areas in Asia, uh, particularly following the uh, rice price uh, sp uh, spikes that started in 2007 and 2008. Um, and, uh, uh, there are plenty of regulations on the books around uh, controlling how uh, pesticides are sold, et cetera. They're not being enforced. And we're seeing outbreaks that are pesticide-induced in rice pests. So it, I would say one of the biggest policy areas that I want gov governments to take uh, pay attention to is rationalize your policies and regulations around inputs. And that includes subsidies, et cetera. Second, I think that's really important, and it's a tougher sell, is uh, rice trade. Uh, I'm a real advocate of, of uh, free trade, open trade in rice. Governments do everything they can to try to make sure that they have enough rice for their own country. And that means that uh, you have uh, a very opaque market, uh, the rice trade. Uh, is 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 thin enough as it is? I think about 10 percent, maybe up to sometimes 14 percent of global rice production is traded, um, and nobody knows really how much rice is produced. Nobody knows how much is entering the trade. Governments, they're the biggest exporters, can block exports like that. What triggered the crises in 2008? was that in late 2000 and mid-2007, Vietnam, the world's number two rice exporter, blocked its exports because it was worried about food, food inflation, canceled contracts. India, world's at that time number one rice exporter, blocked its exports. And so immediately, the rice trade seized up. Nobody knew how much rice was available. And if governments can come in and, 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 and disrupt the trade, um, uh, you uh, you basically have uh, uh, anarchy in, in the rice trade, and so prices are, are, are un, unpredictable. Some people will make a lot of money, but you know who will be the ones who lose? It'll be the poor people. That's you. Uh, so I, I would like to see, uh, and we've been working with ASEAN and and uh, Asian Development Bank to try to look at how we can create a a a rice exchange at least for Asia. So you could have a rice market. And yes, futures would futures market would develop, et cetera. Some people would speculate. That's fine. Let the speculators win and lose. But if we could develop a rice exchange in which farmers could participate, uh, you know, we could have a situation where we could open up the, uh, the overall uh, rice market. So two big policy areas, uh, the inputs, and the second one, uh, uh, rice trade, rice market. Uh, we have time for a handful more questions. I know you had one before. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Delgado. Uh, you partly, you've really partly answered the question, but I want to push you a little further. I mean, given the problems of getting the private sector, particularly the formal mm -hmm. private sector, interested in selling rice seed. And given the concentration of the production in the in the Asian tropics, uh, what what is the right strategy for the public sector really to pursue to get the private sector to take over, increasingly a share of the burden and kind of a second green revolution? Yeah, um, what I'm what my what I'm arguing uh, is that uh, one I think the we need to move away from the mega varieties. Uh, one of the consequences of the Green Revolution uh, that 
basically swept over irrigated rice or where areas where there was good water control was you just had a handful of varieties grown. So one variety or two varieties might have been on 30 or 40 million hectares. Okay. And farmers could save that seed. Not much was coming out. And you didn't have much, to be quite honest, a lot of innovation in the rice uh, variety turnover. Um, so what I see is particularly as a, we see many different traits becoming available. We're looking at the what's going to be coming out of the sequencing program. I, what I see happening is that we will be finally, more finely slicing the rice growing environment and the rice market. A much wider variety of quality characteristics for different market segments, much finer attuning, attuning to different uh, rice production environments. This is a recipe that will encourage the taking up of rice seed production by small and medium seed companies. The multinationals won't be interested in it. But if you go around Bangladesh and Eastern India and, West, and all over India, there's a lot of small companies that are growing vegetable seed, they're, they're growing cotton seeds, uh, etc. cetera, uh, and they would like to produce rice, but there's nothing in it for them. So what I see, sort of my dream, is a situation where the public sector creates a flow of new traits coming in, these can be incorporated into different, uh, many different varieties that are for niche markets that are plenty a profit margin for small and medium-sized seed, seed companies, partitioning the environments, and actually enriching the, the overall rice production environment and something that would be attractive to small and medium-sized seed companies producing inbred rice seed. Uh, enough of a, a stream of, of new traits coming through There'll be enough innovation, enough uh, 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 motivation or incentive for farmers to buy new seed. They may not buy seed every year, but if they buy seed every other year or every third year, there's so damn many of them that there'll be a big enough market. Okay, and so that's and I've talked with a, a lot of the uh, a lot. I've talked with a number of seed small seed companies in eastern India and in Bangladesh, and they're really interested in this model. And they think it'll work. Um, and they're dying to get their hands on new materials. Uh, what they don't want is to be producing, I mean, Swarna, that we, Swarna sub one that we created at flood tolerant varieties, I mean, that was produced in 1978. And it's still out there. I mean, farmers like it, but you know, it's not a great variety. It's got a lot of problems. You know, the seed companies don't want to be producing a variety that's been out there for almost 40 years. They want a new product. And I think that that's, and I think. What with our what's coming out of our, our our sequencing and phenotype area, I think we can actually reinvent the rice seed industry. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> All right, we'll take one more from online. Oh, I've got many more than one, but hopefully we can follow up with you after the seminar. Sure. Um, a historic question for Bob as the director general of the area. How much of the Green Revolution in Asia should be attributed to Erie's technology advances, and how much to the concurrent shift from water buffalo to power, pillar, power tillers? Without that adjustment, would it be possible to cultivate enough area in a timely manner to take advantage of the technology? God, that's a great question. Um, no, it's a great question because what people don't understand, and this person clearly does, is that there's a whole set of other revolutions that, that take place. and uh, one of them was the mechanization, uh, and, and I would say that the original two-wheel power tiller that actually enabled a lot of this was, if you go back, was actually designed at Erie, a very cheap one. Uh, Kubota refuses to fund Erie's work because they can't get into some markets in Asia because our stupid little power tiller that's so cheap is the one the farmers use. Uh, but more importantly, uh, threshing. The ability to thresh a crop. If you're getting, if you're used to getting a ton and a half, and all of a sudden you're getting five or six tons of rice, and you, instead of getting one crop a year, you're getting two or three crops a year, and one or two of those crops is when it's raining, the ability to thresh that grain is a real challenge. And so the, so the, the there are a whole bunch of an, of, of associated technologies that accompanied the higher yielding 
uh, varieties. There was the, the tillage, uh, the need to till land in a timely fashion. There was the uh, ability to, uh, to thresh, just to name two. And those two, and, 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 that, and therein lies the real secret of the Green Revolution. It wasn't just more grain. It was developing an entire economic sector in the rural areas. Machinery shops to repair those tractors and sell them, spare parts. The thresher, who makes the threshers? Who stores the rice? All of that. All of that is what, it's, it's an economic revolution. And so that questioner really hit the nail on the head. That, um, that, that uh, you have, you can have a transformational technology, but it is accompanied by a whole set of other technologies that enable that to, to function. You know, somebody investing in a power tiller wouldn't work if they were getting only a ton of rice a hectare. So they feed back on them. It's really, it's a beautiful, and, and uh, books have been written about it. But it's really, but it's a great question. I think we have time for just one final question in person. And I know I've seen you raise your hand a while back, so I'll my name is Sophie Kelly, and I'm a AAAS fellow with the State Department Africa Group. And I was wondering if different rice varieties vary in their capacity to be stored for long periods of time. Um, so like, for instance, things like mold or breakage in storage. Um, so when you're considering you know, increasing the yield of rice, and I realize that you know, a lot of this rice will be consumed immediately, but yeah. um, is storage a, a factor? Yeah, storage is certainly a, a challenge. And to my knowledge, we have not looked at genetic variation of storability. Uh, the key to uh, storage life of rice are the conditions that it is, uh, enters into storage, has it been dried properly, is it down to a low enough moisture content, and then the actual conditions of the storage containers. Uh, uh, Will they keep insects out? Uh, will they keep the humidity down, et cetera? So it's more, uh, it's more how the grain is handled. Uh, and I confess, I don't, I don't think we've actually looked at um, uh, the characteristics that would determine storability. It would probably be, we have looked at uh, differences in if you dry rapidly, will the grain crack and then break? In, in milling, and there are differences for in that, but it's pretty complex genetically. Um, and I would I, I would guess that the actual starch chemistry could help to, could determine how fast the grain would dry. But again, it's all back down to moisture. What is the grain moisture when you put it into storage? You know, it has to be below a critical level, and then uh, to a large extent, oxygen for insects. All right, we are at the 11 o'clock hour. So I'd like hour. to thank uh, Bob again for a really fantastic presentation. So, okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> really enjoyed it. Actually. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been, been fun. And yeah, thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you at future AgriLinks uh, seminars and webinars.